I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 55 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 055. The House of Representatives in the state of Texas has passed House Bill 910. This is not the same as SB 17, so it will go to... It will go to the Senate for approval. I am thinking that the Senate will approve this bill. However, before we talk about House Bill 910, let's just go ahead and hit our gun of the show. For this episode, I have chosen the Savage Mark II TRR-SR. Now, if you'll remember the last time, I believe I covered a Savage rifle in our last episode, but this is an entirely different package than that rifle there. In fact, this rifle reminds me a lot of my first rifle, which sits right next to it in my safe. Both are bolt actions, they are both chambered in twenty two long rifle, and they are both extremely accurate, and they're both a little on the heavy side as well. Now, the really odd thing about both these rifles is they both came from hardware stores with FFLs, and that is just where the similarities stop. Now, when I first saw this rifle, I actually thought it was a centerfire bolt action because of how heavy it was built. And then I noticed the proportions weren't quite right for a centerfire rifle of any caliber I was familiar with. Not long after picking it up, looking at it, at the dealer's insistence, I was walking out of the store with a new 22 rifle. Now, the Savage Mark II TRR-SR is a very unique-looking rifle. It is equipped with an oversized bolt handle, a heavy wood stock, triple Picatinny rails, and an overbelt appearance that makes this rifle look like it was built more for a professional usage. Now you add on the fact that it features a threaded barrel for suppressors and you have a very effective varmint rifle that, well, when you get right down to it, this thing has no recoil whatsoever. Every 22 I have ever shot has a little bit of recoil. Not enough to really bother anybody, but enough to let you know the rifle is fired. The Savage Mark II TRR-SR, not so much. I have fired quite a few rounds through it and it does not really let you feel the recoil. But then again, this rifle does weigh quite a bit for a 22 bolt action. Now, this particular rifle, I have it zeroed at exactly 100 yards. I don't think it would go any further because the barrel just isn't long enough to support any additional velocity. But, you know, for a Rimfire 22, that's uh, that's doing pretty well to be 100% consistent at 100 yards. Typically, with a lot of 22 rifles, when you get past 75 yards, you start... Uh, I forget the technical term for it, but essentially the shock wave of the bullet breaking the sound barrier catches up with the bullet because it's now slowed down, and that happens somewhere around 75 yards or so with most rifles. It There's a lot of factors that come into play that affects how fast the velocity of the bullet leaves the barrel. Sometimes a new rifle will shoot faster or slower than an older rifle because of wear. If it's too tight, it'll shoot slower. If it's not quite as tight, it might shoot slower. There's a lot of factors that go into play. The length of the barrel is the major one that everybody takes into account. But in the case of this rifle, 100 yards, it's dead on accurate every time it puts around almost in exactly the same location. I would say this thing's less than, at 100 yards, this thing's less than a quarter MOA at, uh, on its groupings. Now, with that said, if you want to pick up one like this one, it's still in production. It has an SKU number of 25752. It is in 22 long rifle, has a capacity of five rounds in the magazine. Now, there are extended magazines available for this rifle. It is a bolt action, so don't think you're going to be buying a 10 22 killer because it's not. As far as sights go, well, this gun is sorely lacking in that area, and it doesn't even come with an optic, although it is set up for one and it comes with the bases, or it comes with a single piece that serves as a base. Now, that single piece includes three Picatinny rails, so... A lot of people will take those off and toss them aside because the extra two rails are useless. For most people, they are. But for me, mm, I really don't mind them, but I don't ever use them either. It's made from, uh, it's got a steel action and the barrel's steel. The stock is wood. There's very little plastic and uh, any kind of polymer in this rifle. In fact, I can't think of anything that actually has a plastic or polymer composition. It weighs in at 7.5 pounds, which is a little hefty for a rifle of its size, especially when you consider it's a Rimfire 22. And the MSRP at the time of this podcast is $627. And once again, we give you my disclaimer on MSRPs. What you're hearing right now can change between the time I record the podcast and the time the podcast is released, which is often just hours. 
or it can change in the span of days or months or weeks or years on however long it takes you to listen to this podcast after I release it. Also, a lot of manufacturers tend to inflate their MSRP so that dealers have something to negotiate from. Now, if you want to look the rifle up, I believe Gallery of Guns has it on their website, or they did this week when I was researching information on the rifle. And some people may say, well, you own this rifle, so why are you researching information on it? That's because I don't remember all the specs for all the guns that I own. However, let's wrap that up, and I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And after that, we're going to come right back, and, well, we're going to talk about listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and, of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. A gentleman, he actually asked that I use his name. He he he, uh, he wrote in. So let me just read this to you like I got it in my show notes. Sherman Langley wrote in with, I remember when you did the Carry Talk podcast, and I checked, so I know you still have the domain. Okay, that's a little bit of dedication. But continuing, he writes, I know you have addressed this before, but you really should bring back the Carry Talk podcast. I think it would be awesome to get it and possibly the Handgun podcast both back, although I know that the Handgun podcast domain was sold and Shelton is out of podcasting and married. And that's the end of his email. Now, for those of you who don't know, I did do a podcast when I first got into podcasting. It was a gun podcast, and it was called the Carry Talk Podcast. Kind of an experimental podcast. I tried a lot of things out, learned learned how to actually do podcasting with it. And I will admit, I keep getting these requests to bring that show back. I really don't know why everybody wants it so bad. If you ever listened to the very first episode I recorded for that, you would understand. It was terrible. Let me say that again. It was terrible. However, I after the legislative session's over, I may look into relaunching that podcast, although I will be getting someone else to host it or co-host it because I don't have time to do that, do this one, and the occasional episode we do on the Pro Gun Podcast. But let me say again, after the legislative session is over, I will look into relaunching it and recruiting another host for it. As for Eric Shelton and the Handgun Podcast, I don't know what to say to you about that, bud. You're out of luck there. Maybe you ought to write him. I'm certain he, I think he still has a blog. He doesn't post to it very much, but I think he does have a blog. Maybe you ought to look him up and send him an email about getting back into podcasting. Now, I did have a few other emails, but nobody actually let me know that I could use their email in the podcast. But one of them actually addressed the audio level of the of the sound clips I play that tell you how to get the show, where to find it, where to find me in the show on social media, and how to contact me. I am experimenting with the audio levels, and when you hear this, if they're too low or too loud, let me know and I'll adjust them from there. Speaking of which, I think it's time to run the social media audio clip, and then I'll come back and we'll move on to our topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. And we're back in with the episode where we're going to talk about House Bill 910 making progress in the state legislature. Or one of the episodes, I hope. I hope it's not just one. Now, the Texas legislature had a tough time getting House Bill 910 into its second reading in the state house. But it's done, so let's take a look at what happened. The first thing I have to take note of is in the in the lead up to the bill, there was an arrest by of an OCT member for wearing a kilt and a blue gun. Well, actually, I don't think he was arrested for wearing the kilt, but he was wearing a kilt with the digital camo pattern, and he was wearing a blue gun. Well, let me say that this gentleman, according to Open Carry Texas Facebook post, he is a member of the group. Lone Star Gun Rights has a video of the arrest, and well, it's not that it's not a bad video to watch i'm if i can think to i'll try to remember and put a sh- link to it in the show notes however let me say that if you're uh, if you're the leader of an organization having your members or posting about your members getting arrested at the capitol repeatedly it doesn't advance anything you might let your members know that hey going up here to the capitol showing your butt and getting arrested isn't going to help 
And some people may say, well, did he really show his butt because he's wearing a kilt? No. When I say showing his butt, I mean he showed his butt in a figurative sense. And what happens when you go up to the Capitol, you get arrested, you're, you're making the group look bad. And this takes away political capital, not, from the, not only from the group, but from all Texas gun rights organizations, whether they're friendly or if they're neutral to you. Because now they're having to distance themselves from your, you or your group, and that doesn't exactly help matters. And if you're looking for a lawsuit to help advance rights, then this is not really the way to go about it. You don't have to be arrested to have standing to get to file a lawsuit. Essentially, what I'm saying is, if you're looking to file a lawsuit against the state troopers that do security at the DPS, or the DPS that do security at the state capitol, then go up there. When you're told to leave, do so. You got your standing. Now go file your lawsuit. But I don't think that's what this is about. I think this is more of a, I want to get my cool kids card. And the only way I can do that is get arrested at the state capitol like C.J. Grisham and all the others did. And that's really what we're looking at here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move on and we're going to talk about the amendments to House Bill 910 or the attempted amendments as well as the ones that were adopted. But before that, I do that, I want to run a little audio clip from Representative Phillips who, the, this audio clip is from the end of the debate on the bill when he was giving his closing remarks. And I think it's best to run that before I do the amendments because it makes sense and it kind of sets the tone. This bill goes too far for some and not far enough for others. But I think it's a good start. And I agree. So let's move on to our amendments. There were 18 amendments proposed during the second reading of the bill. Amendment 1 changes nursing home to nursing facility. And this bill was introduced by the author of the bill, and Representative Phillips withdrew the amendment. I'm not entirely sure why he withdrew it, but he withdrew the amendment. And, well, in all honesty, I haven't looked at it in too much detail, but I under, but he someone else introduced the, what was essentially the same amendment. I don't know what was different between them, and that amendment was accepted. So obviously there was something different about the two if Phillips withdrew this one but accepted another one. That was nearly identical, if not identical. Now, with that said, we can move on to the second amendment of the bill, or the second attempted amendment. And the second amendment to the bill, not the second amendment to the Constitution, but the second amendment to the bill, this amendment would have prohibited Texas residents from carrying on an out-of-state license. This amendment was proposed by Navarez, and it was tabled. Now, the history behind this amendment and this amendment has been proposed as legislation, as amendments in the past. But the idea behind this is there are people that cannot carry under a Texas CHL. One of them would be, hmm, let's think of an example here that's well known and has actually mentioned he's lost his CHL. That would be C.J. Grisham. So C.J. Grisham does not have a Texas CHL. He has made statements that he has an out-of-state license, although he won't admit what state it's from or show us a redacted copy of it, so we know for a fact that he actually does have it. But we'll take him at his word, just like Senate, uh, Representative Navarez did. And these folks are they are carrying on these out-of-state licenses, and that's perfectly fine. But the anti-gunners don't want that. And when you have somebody as high-profile as C.J. Grisham, you bring attention to it, and people are going to try to do something about it. If this continues to be an issue in the next legislative session, then we're going to have a problem there too. However, I'm thinking, and this is just me, but I'm thinking that if we get this license, if we get, if we can defeat this amendment, and we can defeat any bills that have this language or this amended to them, we'll be doing good. And this amendment was tabled. Now, the third amendment to the bill, also by Navarez, it was tabled as well, but it gutted 30-06. It was essentially his House Bill 2405 amended to the open carry bill. And then there was Amendment Number 4. Amendment Number 4 would have required a retention holster. This amendment was proposed by Canales, I believe is how it's pronounced. I apologize if I mispronounced it. And it, too, was tabled. And then there was a fifth amendment to the bill that would have required that the license or some other form of ID to that shows you were licensed to carry a handgun would have to be visible if you were openly carrying a handgun. Now, this amendment was offered by Davis and Yvonne, or maybe Yvonne Davis. I don't know if it was both 
if it was somebody named Yvonne and somebody named Davis or if it was uh, Yvonne Davis. I don't know. I just copied the names over from the House Journal. But anyways, the amendment was tabled and it was followed up by an amendment from, from Dutton, which would have required li- liability insurance. Now, the, looking the amendment over, I didn't have time to really read it in detail. But looking the amendment over, it would only have required it for open carry. Now, the amendment was tabled. It was not an issue as a result. The Seventh Amendment to the bill was by Canalis as well, and it addressed carrying of other weapons by license holders. More specifically, it was targeted towards knives. However, the amendment basically said, well, if you got a CHL, you can carry the knife as well. And, oh, by the way, the penalties for carrying a knife in a prohibited location for a handgun now apply to carrying a knife or the the penalties for carrying a handgun in a prohibited location for a handgun, those prohibited locations and that penalty now apply to a knife. Well, Amendment 7 was tabled. And let me go into a little bit of detail here. When an amendment is withdrawn, that means the author has pulled it out of consideration and it doesn't get to go back in in its current form. It may be resubmitted, but that very seldom happens. When an amendment is tabled, that means it was voted and put aside. And while, and when an amendment's tabled, it's essentially killed. Amendment 8 by Johnson was about municipal regulation of open carry. Now, in its original form, this amendment would have regulated open carry, or allowed cities to regulate open carry if they had a population of 1 million or more. Now, this particular amendment was amended by Amendment 9, and I'm going to address it, and then we will come back and discuss the status of both. Amendment 9 was intended to amend Amendment 8 to allow cities with a population of three-quarters of a million or 750,000 people or more to regulate open carry. This amendment was passed so that Amendment 8 was amended by it. This amendment did not make it to House Bill 910 because Amendment 8 was tabled. Essentially, Amendments 8 and 9 were combined into one, and that combined amendment was tabled. Now, Amendment 9 was offered by Eddie Rodriguez. Now, Amendment 10 by Farias, or Farias, I don't, I assume I've mispronounced his name since I pronounced it differently twice, and I apologize if I, and I apologize for mispronouncing it, and I definitely apologize if I mispronounced it twice. However, the amendment would require the DPS to provide some rather useless reports to the legislature. The amendment was tabled, so it's no longer in consideration as well. And then we have Amendment 11. Amendment 11 by Fletcher was withdrawn, and there was a point of order raised against the amendment because it would have changed the original intention of the bill. You see, Amendment 11 would have amended House Bill 910 so that open carry also had campus carry added into it. Well, we have a campus carry bill, and we're expecting it to, uh, we're expecting it to come up for a vote pretty soon in the House. As a result, I'm going to say that I expect campus carry to actually pass this time. So this amendment was just kind of somebody trying, okay, I want to make sure I get insurance on my bill. And that's just bad sportsmanship in, or bad, that, well, bad sportsmanship in politics, okay? And now we come to Amendment 12. Amendment 12 was, mm, nah, nah, nah. this one does not sit well with me. It was an it was by Farias or Farias or however you mispronounce his name. Yep, that's how I said it. I mis however I mispronounce his name. Now Amendment Twelve was tabled. However, if it had passed, there would have been a restriction on how much ammunition you could carry. You could carry one magazine for each weapon that you have on you. Now I don't know about you, but there's a saying: one is none, two is one, and magazines are typically the most likely failure point of a semi-auto. Or let me readdress that. Magazines are the second most likely failure point for a semi-auto, the first being the user. But mechanically, it's the most likely corporate of a malfunction. And essentially, this would have said, well, you cannot have spare magazines. This bill was tabled. It's no longer a problem. Or not bill, this amendment was tabled. It's no longer a problem. And then Amendment 13, which had the same intent as Amendment 1, was offered by Sanford, and it changes nursing home to nursing facility, just like Amendment 1 was intended to. It was adopted, so 
this amendment made it into the bill. And now we move to Amendment 14, which it's essentially, there's reciprocity requirements, and Amendment 14 would have changed how reciprocity was done with the state, with the CHL or other concealed handgun licensed states. Now, Amendment 14 was tabled, and Coleman went home a sad camper because of it. Essentially, this would have said, well, we're going to, we're going to eliminate a lot of the reciprocity agreements in the state. That's really what it was aimed at. Why would they want to do that? It's not because they want to keep people from out of state carrying here. It's because this is an underhanded way of keeping people like C.J. Grisham from carrying on an out-of-state license. And that's really what was intended. And then Amendment 15 came forward. And Amendment 15 would have been a good amendment, except it looked kind of confusing in the way that it was added to the, or the langu- how the language was in the amendment. And what it did was it clarified the activities or the school activities prohibition. Let's say you you are somewhere, I don't know, the state capitol, and you're walking along and a school bus full of children pulls up and they come into the, into the capitol because they're having a field trip. Well, this amendment would make it perfectly clear that, well, you were there first, so you are not in violation of, you know, well, you're not in violation of the prohibition on, at school activities. And then there's Amendment 16. Amendment 16, or, well, let's go back to Amendment 15 because it was tabled. It was not added to the bill. But I do believe there's a bill filed that kind of does the same thing. But Amendment 16 relates to the authority to detain and demand ID for for handgun carry. It was filed by Chris Turner, and the status on this one was it's tabled. Essentially, this amendment would have allowed uh, police officers... uh, magistrates and anybody else that was an officer of the court essentially for the state to walk up and demand ID as well as confiscate your weapon if they felt it was necessary. Well, this, uh, this amendment was tabled. It was a bad amendment and I'm glad that it's, uh, it's no longer an issue. Amendment, we got two amendments left and amendment 17 would have allowed school board members to carry, although it would not have allowed the general public. Now, this one was offered by Huberty, and it was withdrawn after, after Phillips basically told him, no, this one, this is not getting in, and he withdrew it. He, he, really, he really saved people from having to vote it down. And then we have Amendment 18. This is the last amendment that was offered to House Bill 910 by the House, and this one reduced the penalty for 30-06 in some cases. This amendment was offered by Schaefer, and it was initially opposed by Phillips, but he withdrew his objection and allowed the House to vote on the amendment. The House voted, and the amendment was accepted. Now that the amendment was adopted, that means it, and I'm going to have to scroll back through, but it and the, one, and the amendment that changed nursing home to nursing facility were both adopted, and those were the only two amendments to House Bill 910, as it was reported from the committee. Now, the opposition did delay, and they attempted to to amend the bill. And a lot of this was just efforts to kill the bill or poison it. They attempted to, well, on Tuesday, they actually did manage to bring up a point of order and delay the bill. They delayed it to, to Friday for its second reading. And, well, it didn't really do anything. But there were additional attempts to raise points of order. None of them were successful. A majority of amendments that were intend, were offered were actually intended to dilute or poison the bill. None of those were successful. And uh, amendment attempts by supporters, well, there were several attempts made by supporters of the bill to attach pro-gun legislation to it. Some were to expand the scope of the bill, and Jonathan Stickland had quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to talk about him a little bit more, so let's just go ahead and do that. Jonathan Stickland is the author of House Bill 195, which is the unlicensed constitutional carry bill. Now, Stickland attempted to force his amendment into the debate. I'm not entirely sure what his amendment was. One person on the Texas CHL forum, there's a huge thread. It's like 40-something posts long, or 40-something pages long on the Texas CHL forum that deals with the second reading of House Bill 910 in in the state house. And one of the posts in there, a member of the forum says he heard from a reliable source Stickland's amendment was intended to reduce the fee of the CHL process from $140 for new 
for CHLs and $70 for renewals, it was intended to reduce it from there to free. And while that might not be a bad idea, if that's really the case, there was nothing in the bill that addressed that aspect of it. And if it doesn't touch that particular portion of the code, it's not germane. And that would make, oh man, there was, a, there was probably 30 minutes of him trying to make parliamentary inquiries and force his amendment into the debate. Well, with all that fit pitching, he made no progress. He tried to bully his amendment in. It didn't make it. Every time it was, well, the amendment was not germane. We're not going to address it on the floor right now. You can come up and talk to me, but I'm not going to allow your amendment to be addressed in its current state on the floor. And that's really what he was told. After he attempted to bully it and bully his way into getting his amendment onto the bill, nothing ever came of it. Well, at the end of the hearing, on, or at the, end of, at the end of the debate for the bill, Phillips made the announcement I played at the start of the amendment, or right before I started talking about the amendments, and Stickland attempted to get Phillips to give HB 195 a committee hearing. And Phillips explained why unlicensed carry was dead in the legislature for this session. But you know what? I could go back. I could explain it all myself. But that really wouldn't do you any good because I think it's better that I let you hear it as it was done in the, on the floor of the legislature. So I am waking up my tablet, which has all my audio clips on it. And now I'm going to play the exchange between Phillips and Stickland when, uh, when Phillips tells him why unlicensed constitutional carry is dead in the legislature for this session. And for everybody that thinks that Open Carry Texas and Stickland are heroes and patriots and they're making all this progress, well, after you hear this, you'll understand why I say that why I say they're not making progress. They're not heroes and they're not patriots. They're just whiny children. Questions on the bill. Representative Phillips, I appreciate your efforts on this bill. You know that I am a strong Supporter of the Second Amendment, you know that I have been working very hard for open carry for Texans. We disagreed on the way to go about that. I was just curious on a personal level. I know that you have maintained that this bill was specifically about license holders. You know my argument is, is different and that we shouldn't have the license to begin with. Will you honestly work with me? Will you, will you give my bill a hearing in your committee so that we can have that discussion? You know that I am going to support your bill today because it's an advancement of Second Amendment rights, but there are literally tens of thousands of people who Mr. believe we Mr. need Stickland. to go to more. Will you work with me, Representative Phillips? Let me answer that. Mr. Stickland, uh, the fate of your bill was cast when the Senate decided they were not going to take up constitutional carry. I'm not going to argue with you. Your fate was treated as how you treated members on this floor as it related to your legislation and other legislation. It's also how those that support your amendment have treated members of this House, their families, and our staff, that there is no reason when there's other members who've worked hard, who try to work with each other, they have to have a chance to have their hearing. They're going to get a hearing. And there you have it. You now know exactly why Constitutional carry is dead. House Bill 195 is dead for this session. It's because of how people acted. And who were those people that were mentioned? Well, I'm not going to come out and say it. They know who they are. The listeners of this podcast pretty much know who they are. So, House Bill 910. It made it to its second reading. It was passed in engrossment. It passed with 96 yeas, 35 nays, and one not present, or one present not voting. Now, King... Eh, King had it added to the journal. He was in the House, but away from his desk, and that the journal shows a statement that he would have voted yes. Well, I'll be honest. I know, I, I'm trying to get away from saying I'll be honest, but that's a dig at a certain person that kept making comments on either, well, they made comments to me, and I would I made a dig at them. But anyways, the <sighs> House Bill 910 made progress. House Bill 910 is not the bill that a lot of people want. House Bill 910 is not the bill that I would have preferred, but it's the best bill that we can get passed. Don't get me wrong. I would love to take and get... There are bills I felt would be more important, but getting open carry done while we can get it, that's critical. This is the time to pass it. We can get it. If we can keep people from going out there and doing stupid things when we get House Bill 910 passed and into effect, 
Then we go out there, we take our legislation, or we take and we act like normal, sane human people. We don't go around. We don't do in-your-face activities. And we show the public, hey, we're good people. We are you. Now, we have had open carry however many years when we finally get ready to make our push for unlicensed open carry and unlicensed carry. And we make our push. We say, hey, look, we've had concealed handgun carry for uh, 20 plus years. We've had open carry for X, Y, Z or X years. And now here you are and we're you don't have a license, but we're trying to get it where you can carry too. Please support us. Help us get you a light. Help us get you the right to carry. But you don't do it by getting in their face and telling them, well, you don't go up to them and go, war garble from my cold dead hands, open carry now, war garble. You don't do that. And that's something that a lot of the groups out there, especially open carry Tarrant County was doing. They were going and they were shoving it in people's faces and they made a lot more enemies than they did friends. And when you want to pass legislation, you want friends, not enemies. If we could convert Pancho Navarez from anti-gun to pro-gun, imagine how much pull he would bring with him. But going into his office and showing your butt doesn't help things. It just cements him further into the opposition column. And before, while I'm certain he probably wouldn't have changed his ways, I can guarantee you now he won't change his ways. We may be able to wiggle him loose and bring him into the light and bring him over to our side, but it's going to take a lot more work now than it would have ever have taken if Corey Watkins and crew hadn't acted the way they did. And that's really why House Bill 910 is where it's at and not House Bill 195. That and the behavior of Jonathan Stickland and his and the way that he was addressing people in the legislature. And that's another thing. You got to pick you got to pick who carries your bill. Stickland, he's not going to be good to carry water for any for anybody supporting any bill right now. Nobody's going to want to be seen in his camp. Why? Because he he is associated too closely with Open Carry Tarrant County, Open Carry Texas, the National Association for Gun Rights, and all these other organizations that they're taken as an extremist group and their extremist behavior. And now, here they are. Here he is. He's acting just like the people that are doing the in-your-face tactics. He's in-your-face with the state representatives, and nobody wants to support his bill. I guarantee you. Anybody that wants legislation passed will not go to Stickland to get it passed. If they want legislation passed, they will go to somebody else, even if it's even if Stickland's or Stickland is their rep. They will go to somebody else simply because Stickland can't get it passed. He has no political capital now. He wasted it all on House Bill 195 and being a jackass. Well, I better run the promo contact or the contact promo and then come back and do the news so that we can wrap the show up. However, before we go, let me say thank you to Alice Tripp, Tara Mitcha, and Charles Cotton for getting House Bill 910 to where it's at. I also want to say thank you to the members of the NRA, to the members of the TSRA. I want to say thank you to Terry Holcomb as well. He has worked on getting House Bill 910 passed. I want to say thank you to his membership in Texas, the membership of Texas Carry for helping. Texas Carry has not been as in your face as the other groups. They have been a little more in your face than, say, the NRA and the TSRA. But they have not. They have suddenly changed. They've gotten in line, and now they're acting. They're acting like they're a sane group, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that Terry Holcomb has gone to bat, and he's presented a sane face to the legislature. I hope he keeps it up. I would love to see. I'll be honest. I would love to see more groups in Texas with the political pull to do things. Because when you have the TSRA and the NRA as your two groups in Texas, you have two groups that you got you got to make sure support your bill, and that limits their political capital. But if you have a third group that you that has a little bit of pull, suddenly the dynamic changes because now the if that third group is working on the same legislation as the other two, suddenly it's a matter of. We don't know how much of an overlap is between these two groups, but we got to appease these two groups. But let's say you bring in a couple of other groups that are sane. They have they develop the ability to have political capital. They get progress. They get results. 
And when they work on legislation, and now you got groups working together, you have three or four groups that are doing something that actually pushes for results. Suddenly, all that political capital, a lot of it's lost in overlap, but you gain political capital. And I would love to see more of it. I don't want to see a whole bunch of crazy groups like Open Carry Tarrant County because they cost political capital. But now I'm running and I'm going to run the contact promo. So I'll be back in just a moment and we'll hit the news. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, we're back for the politics section of the Gun Rights in Texas news. And the first one, the first news item I want to touch on is where... There's a discussion in the news about House Bill 910 being sent back to committee after the Prince of Pooh called a point of order regarding an issue with a witness list. Now, this was for the second hearing or the second reading on Tuesday. The bill was fast tracked back through the committee and calendars committee, getting it back on the floor for its second reading. The delay in tactics from extremist positions of both sides were seemingly working together against this bill as Representative Stickland reportedly claimed he had 162 amendments for the bill, which could delay it to the point of killing it. While that didn't happen, the bill made it through. There were only 18 amendments attempted by various parties, or 18 amendments that actually made it to the floor of the House, and only two of them made it into the bill. So I just wanted to include that particular story as kind of a supporting story for the, or supporting news article for the uh, interference from the anti-gunners in Stickland. Now, we do have a story where KXAN, and that's, I want to say KXAN's a radio station, but they may be a TV station, but they're reporting that Texas police chiefs are expressing concern over the open carry bill. Now, the truth about this issue is that the open carry bill should change nothing for how police officers operate, except that when they come up on somebody, they'll be able to see that these people are armed instead of having to wait for those same licensed individuals to tell them. Essentially, this is going to make law enforcement officers' jobs easier to identify armed people in some cases. Also, keep in mind that Texas license holders are also more law-abiding than even the police officers that are pitching a fit about this open carry bill. And it's not me saying this. This is reports and statistics from the DPS that say this. And finally, I want to touch on a story I don't like touching on out-of-state stories, but this one, it's going to be used by the anti-gun crowd to attack open carry. So let's go ahead and deal with it now. A Washington man was attacked in a Walmart store by a felon. Now, I have heard another story. I'll touch on that in a moment, though. But he was attacked by a felon who picked up a baseball bat in an effort to steal the victim's openly carried handgun. The victim held his attacker at gunpoint until police arrived, and the felon got nowhere in his efforts because the victim was able to fight back with a tool that gave him the advantage after a surprise attack. Now, in my feeds, I saw an article, and I kind of lost it, and I have been able to refine find it again. But there's an article saying, well, the guy's not really a felon, but he he had a serious misdemeanor conviction, and we're not sure if he was actually trying to take the gun, and he might have been mentally mentally ill. But who knows? He attacked an open carrier with a gun, or he attacked an open carrier who had a gun, and he lost. He didn't get shot. He didn't get killed, but he still lost. And that's the thing. Gun owners don't want to kill anybody. Contrary to what the anti-gun folks and the anti-gun groups are saying, gun owners don't want to commit murder. They don't want to go on killing sprees. Open carry doesn't lead to blood in the streets. Let's face it. Open carry is not going to cause massive problems. The first few months that open carry is legal in Texas, it could lead to an increase in 911 calls by people trying to make political statements. Oh, there's a gun. I'm going to get that guy in trouble. <laughs> I want to swat that guy. <laughs> but you know what? We get a few episodes. We get a few of those. And the anti-gunners, the hysteric phone call makers and all those, they're going to say, hey, I got no results out of that. It didn't stop people. It didn't scare people into doing what I want. And they'll stop. 
You'll still have the occasional crazy that listens to the MDA, or that's Mom's Demand Action crowd, when they try to wish violence and death upon others, but you won't, you won't see it as often as you will in the first few months, and eventually these problems will go away, and it won't take long at all. And with that said, let me say once again, I want to thank uh, Tara Mitchell, Alice Tripp, Charles Cotton, all the support staff in the NRA and the TSRA, and that includes the membership. I want to thank Terry Holcomb. I want to thank Texas Carries Infrastructure as well. I want to thank everybody that has called, in, called, faxed, emailed, and even wrote letters. I want to thank everybody that has done anything at all to push this bill. Now, keep in mind, I'm not trying to thank those that have said, we are opposed to this bill because it is not going far enough. No, I'm not thanking them. I'm thanking the folks that have actually done something good, done something to get this bill passed, and got this bill to where it's at today. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.